because I'm tiny and I can't handle too much. Huh, funny. Christine is a f***ing pain in the ass. Without you, there wouldn't be a family. I, I was almost left with the choice of having to decide between you or having a child. Asians are practical. Hey guys, it's Sarah and welcome back to my YouTube channel. So now we are going into the second reaction episode of Bling Empire, which all my friends, especially my friends in America, have been talking about. Some of my friends have been loving it, some of my Chinese friends refuse to watch it. And so as a result, I've been watching it myself so I can give you my two cents as an etiquette expert because I work, live and play in the world of rich Asians. So I'm going to share with you episode two, what they're getting right, what they're getting wrong, and the difference between Americanized rich Chinese and rich Chinese from China. Because I'm tiny and I can't handle too much. Huh, funny. My mom was seriously strict with me about manners. Uh, being a lady, Christine is a f***ing pain in the a Agree, Christine is a f***ing pain in the a She's rich, but she has no manners. So guys, takeaway here is money does not equal manners. If you're rich, doesn't mean that you're well brought up. Case in point, Anna's mom was very strict with her. Anna is well brought up. Christine obviously did not have that upbringing. And how can you be well brought up? Well, it's really about having a mother who cares about your manners. That's why my etiquette school is women's only. And we're 80% young mothers, yummy mummies. They know the kind of kids that they want to be able to bring up. They want to be a better mom to their kids even then their mothers were to them. I mean, you know, a lot of people ask me, Sarah, why do these Chinese ladies come to you for etiquette classes? Are they trying to marry a rich man? Well, actually, 80% of my students at my etiquette school are already married. That's right. And the reason they come is because they realize that, you know, their mothers grew up during the Cultural Revolution in China. People grew up desperately poor, especially in the 70s, 80s, and some of the 90s. So my students say that they know there's a gap in their own upbringing because their mothers just didn't know any better, you know, to teach them how to savoir faire, savoir vivre. Whereas now they themselves are mothers and they know their kids are going to be really international, traveling the world, expanding family businesses all over the world, studying abroad. And so my students say that they need to know how to be a better mother to their kids than their mothers were to them. Because money does not equal manners. Just because you're rich doesn't mean that you're well brought up, okay? Two separate things. Baby G, it's time it's for swim one. class. Two, three. Woo! Yay! 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 Okay. Up and under. And only third lesson. He's a he is? Oh, thank goodness. If you were giving him a report card, you would give him a report card. Baby G, baby G, we're in a work card in A-plus, okay? Do you think we're pushing him too hard? Oh, no, he loves going in the water. Come on. Okay, this is Asian parenting to the max. To Asian parents, your child can never be good enough. Nothing's ever good enough. It's always tough love. You have to be better. You're not good enough. Now, that really reminds me of when I was a little girl and I would get, if I got, you know, an 80% in a test, my mom would say, where did the other 20% go? If I got 100% in my test, my mother would say, let's see if you can maintain that again next time. By the way, these stories are universal. All my Chinese friends all say, yep, my parents exactly the same thing. You know, no wonder Asian parenting produces kids that just don't feel worthy of themselves, that feel like they never get their mother's love, that the mother's love is always conditional. If you get a nay, then you're loved. If you, you know, get 100%, then you're a good child, you're a good son, you're a good daughter. And it's really different to Western parenting, which is like, oh, do you feel that you tried your best? You did? Okay, then you got to see that's Great. What are the pros and cons of Asian versus Western parenting? To be honest, I was a really lazy child. I needed to be pushed. So if my mother were not like pushing me every step of the way, then I definitely would not have gotten into Phillips Extra Academy, Georgetown, etc. And what for me was really eye-opening was that when I went to Phillips Extra Academy, which as some of you know in America know, is a really competitive boarding school, high school. When I got there, I realized, whoa, all these white kids whose parents never pushed them, whose parents are like, yeah, do what you're want, we're super laissez-faire, in the summers you don't need tutoring, you just go lifeguard at the beach, work at a restaurant. So all, all my white classmates and white friends, I realized
realize, wow, like those kids were true geniuses because they got to where they got to entirely because of themselves. So I think as a result, I mean, because Asian kids are pushed so hard, education is the number one thing in Asian culture. And when I see my American friends or white friends, most Americans just go, go to, you know, whatever, whatever school, education is not considered as important relative to Chinese culture. But the ones that go to the top schools are like super, super geniuses because they were really self-motivated. So I think there are pros and cons to Asian parenting. Now, as for mainland Chinese parents, it is very much about, okay, you need to get to the best school, you need to work really hard. And when I see some of my clients' kids, I'm like, geez, I feel really bad for these kids. They're seven, eight years old and they don't go to bed till 10 p.m. because they have so much homework to do. I personally think a kid needs to be a kid, have time to play. But I also understand when you're in that social circle, and this is the same for New York, London, Hong Kong, wherever, right? And all the kids, your friends' kids are getting top scores and going to the best schools. Then even if you weren't initially a super stressed out parent, you become a stressed out parent. 11 years of marriage, 10 years of trying. The family was starting to get very upset. I always had to sit at the kids' table. I had to wash all of the dishes for every holiday. That was just a reminder that I wasn't worthy and I didn't carry my weight. And it wasn't until the actual birth of baby G that I felt a genuine acceptance. Whew. Yeah, there you go. So Christine, until she gave birth to a child, she really wasn't considered part of the family. And that kind of is true in Chinese culture. I mean, until a woman gives birth to a son, it, you know, that's part of the husband's family name, her husband's family don't really think of her as like part of their family. I mean, for example, I have an aunt who married my uncle and they were married for like, a good maybe 12 years um, and she never had kids with him because you know she was a second wife and he had kids from his previous marriage so in some way you know it's it's different i think if she had a kid it's different that's like you your blood is mixed together um but if you don't you're still kind of considered like you're not just considered as close unfortunately and yes so christine is kind of spot on about this so number one you have to produce a child number two ideally a son in fact the perfect combination is what we call so the brother's the older one and then the second one one's the daughter. That's the ideal combo. But you know, the fact that Christine's family made her sit at the kids' table and wash all of the dishes on the family holidays, that's just really heartbreaking. I mean, even though I don't like Christine, it's I still feel really bad for her. And Chinese culture is really good to doing that. They're good at making you feel unworthy, at making you feel like, you know, you're not accepted. It's a tough culture. You know, Asian culture does that. I mean, there is this, they try to shame you. You know, they're not going to do it to like friends. They really just do this to family members for some reason. Without you, there wouldn't Get that. There's the I, I was almost left with the choice of having to decide between you or having a child. Surrogacy yeah. is a real option that I would have you strongly consider. I honestly just never even considered surrogacy. I, I was always under the impression that surrogacy was something that Asians tend to look down on or stay away from. I just don't, I don't want to do anything that would offend your parents and bring shame to your family. Ooh, here we go, shame again, losing face. <laughs> Baby Jay. Oh, do you want to play with it? Oh my gosh. Are you going to let him be an only child? I hope so. If we were to have more kids, I would have to use a surrogate. So what's wrong with that? It's not an Asian thing to do. Like, you carry your own baby. Hi, baby G. I don't think that's right. So Christine says that in Asian culture, you carry your own baby. And actually that is true. You do carry your own baby in traditional parts of Chinese culture. So Hong Kong, Taiwan, are more traditional. I don't know anybody who's done surrogacy, but starting about five years ago in mainland China, it seems like everybody and their mother's doing surrogacy, especially amongst the rich, the famous, the celebrity, they're all doing surrogacy. Chinese celebs started doing surrogacy probably about 10 years ago because obviously their figure and everything. My etiquette students that have husbands who are very rich and have to travel a lot, they are doing surrogacy and the husbands are very supportive of them. And usually it's sort of the older husband with the with the younger younger wife and they say, yeah, you know, we don't, pregnancy is so tough on your body. Oh, we don't want to do that. You know, I don't want to do that to you. It's such a strain on your body. Yes, let's find a surrogacy. And that way when I travel, you can stay with me and da, 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 da. You know, obviously women at that level, I mean, their husbands who are at that level have women 
and jumping them all the time. Beautiful women, you know, all sorts of women. So it's a lot of pressure to be a wife at that level. Uh, you kind of want to maintain your figure and you know, everything. So they're getting surrogacy. Um, some of my etiquette students that don't have husbands and don't want husbands are doing surrogacy because they just want kids. They don't want any man in the picture except for his sperm. And then a lot of my gay guy friends in China uh, in the last five years have also been doing surrogacy. I would say something that maybe American Chinese are still against, but hell, rich Chinese in China, very open-minded to the idea of surrogacy. And why do I say rich? Because it's something that's very expensive. Surrogacy is actually technically illegal in China. So people, and so is freezing your eggs. Therefore, people often find surrogates in America. And you're talking about, I mean, it can be hundreds of thousands of US dollars. That's why only really rich Chinese can afford to do it. Yummy, yummy, baby G. I can't see how life would have been without having a child. I really would like to see him have a sibling but it matters what my parents think. So we need to ask them for their blessings uh, and approval in having a surrogate. So some of my friends, especially my friends in America, were like, we cannot believe that Dr. Chu has to ask for his parents' approval and blessing in order to have a surrogate. But in my culture, it's not entirely out of the ordinary because in Asian culture, it's not about the self. It's not about what you, Sarah Jane Ho, wants. It's about what your whole family wants, your greater community wants, your husband, your parents, your siblings, cousins, grandparents. I mean, it's just the community is never ending. So but most importantly, it's really parents. And, uh, and so that's why Dr. Chu needs to, you know, send this cute little video and make sure his parents are on board before he'll do it. This is also called filial piety. And uh, these traditions and sort of way of thinking go back 2000 years ago to from Confucius's time. Confucius was the original etiquette master 2000 years ago. And he said that so parents are the sky, tian, and kids are di, the earth. So for example, you put in this pecking order, right? So he said husband is above the wife, parents are above the child, blah, 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 blah. And therefore, as a son, as a child, then you always, no matter how old you are, I mean, you may be freaking 40, 50 years old, you still check things with your parents first. I know this is very different from the Western concept where it's like, okay, you're an adult now, go do what you want, you're 18 plus, blah, blah, blah. See ya. I have friends in mainland China who are, you know, Western educated as well, very well off. They seem very international, very independent, but my friend was married and then got divorced and didn't dare tell the parents because knew, first of all, knew that if they asked the parents, parents would be like, no, you're not getting a divorce. So secondly, got a divorce, but didn't tell the parents so the parents think that they're just still married. I also have friends, actually I have family members. One of my relatives was very, very sick. My dad's nephew, we had another relative who basically looked, it was kind of his nanny, but basically, you know, and, and he was really close with this nanny that raised him. And when he was 40 or 50, he got a terminal illness and he used to call this nanny all the time once a week you know wherever he was in the world and then he got so sick but he never told her this nanny who was really became like a second aunt that he was sick and even after he passed away the whole family never told this nanny and she was in the old person's home at that point and she was calling trying to find him and, and they would just say oh no he's on a business trip oh he's really busy he can't talk but he'd already passed away i mean I that just boggles my mind. They, they were worried that she wouldn't be strong enough to handle the information that this relative had died. I mean, really? Like, come on, I think it's even more painful for her to then feel like this person's shunning her. I mean, but anyway, you know, not my realm, not my decision. When anything to help out, what are we doing now? This is Baby G's first modeling shoot. Really? We're doing it for our magazine spread. And then also I was hoping I could use these photos for his preschool application package. Photo shoots for your baby or for your family are huge in China, in case you haven't noticed. I mean, so whenever I'm in China, basically, if I'm at a restaurant, wherever, you'll just see girls taking selfies. I mean, I even had a colleague who like, she would take a selfie for, it was like at a 15 degree angle. So she'd take one here, here, selfie, 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 selfie. It was like 360 degrees, which I mean, okay, I take selfies too but not to that degree and i was like oh so inappropriate. But in China, you just get used to it. Of course, in the West, I toned down my selfies because in the West, it's like, you don't want to be that Asian girl that's taking crazy selfies. But you know, it is a sign of vanity to be taking too many selfies. Anyway, people in China, we love to take photos. And there were, there were these travel packages, at least before COVID hit, where Chinese families, and I had plenty of friends who did this with their families, they would go on destinations for photo shoots. So in fact, one of my cameramen that I used to have for our events at the etiquette school, he actually led 
did a, it was like photo shoot travel holiday. And we had a bunch of students that took their families with him. It was like four or five families and they went to Japan and they all got dressed up in like Japanese traditional gear, like geishas and this and that. And in order to take this family photo and they traveled for it and then came back. I mean, my Western friends don't travel in order to take a photo. It's just basic they travel because they choose the place they want to go to and then take a photo. China's pretty obsessed with photo shoots. What's in the pot? It's a dish that I've been preparing for like a month already. I just put in the pig feet and the eggs like last week. Oh, why is it black? It's black because of the vinegar. Uh, you know, like, really, I mean, the taste you... is weird. The vinegar is great. The green oh. is great. No, I don't want that. <laughs> I'm sure this is a pretty unforgettable scene for some of you guys that watched it. This is a classic Cantonese dish. Cantonese means south of China, where I'm from, Canton province. And it is a traditional pork knuckle with vinegar and ginger dish that's cooked in a clay pot. There's vinegar because it breaks down the calcium in the pork knuckles. Pork knuckles also has a lot of collagen, so it's good for your skin. I love eating it. And uh, when pregnant women, because Cherise, obviously she had a baby and she's pregnant. So pregnancy and breastfeeding can really deplete the calcium in your bones. And so this particular dish replenishes you with the calcium that you need. It is classic. It looks gross. It tastes delicious. And I highly recommend you guys try it really well. I lived in like a loft that overlooked Mount Fuji and I had a great time. But my mom, like any typical, you know, Asian parents, she wanted me to be a doctor or lawyer. She didn't want me to pursue music. She didn't want any of that. Yeah, that's an Asian parent for you. They want their kids to be a doctor, a lawyer, or an accountant, including my mom, kind of. So, you know, that was Cherie's mom just now. Didn't want to pursue anything artistic. Well, after Phillips Exeter Academy, I went and did my bachelor's at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. And I was, when I was deciding my major, I decided to be an English major, which uh, according to, I mean, it's really rare to find someone from Hong Kong or China, Asian, that majored in English because it's considered really useless. I remember my mom would always be like, do you want to minor in accounting? When I came back for the holidays, my uncles and aunts would be like, oh, what is Sarah going to major in? And I'd say English. And they would turn to my parents and say, but Sarah's English is already so good. Asians are practical. Therefore, they want their kids to be able to make money and put food on the table. Seniors, because I have really bad contractions, I thought the baby was going to come. It was like really bad because, you know, I've been at the hospital for 10 months helping my mom. She passed away like last month and I haven't been to the hospital for a month and I just hate, 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 hate hospitals. I'd rather give birth at home. Yeah, so wow, Cherie, I really admire you. I mean, taking care of your mother in hospital every day for 10 months going there and I can just imagine how it is because in Chinese culture, in Chinese culture, people give birth so that in their old, old age, their kids can look after them. Yes, that is a thing. So their kid can then give them money and support them and look after them in every single way. Of course, in, you know, in Cherie's case, her parents are rich, but still because of the Chinese filial piety, she basically every day that her mother was in hospital was in hospital too. And I can empathize with that because when I was 21, my mother got diagnosed with terminal cancer and I was in my spring semester at Georgetown. So I dropped everything. I was going to graduate. I dropped everything, flew back to Hong Kong, spent two weeks with my mom. I told my mom, put Georgetown on hold, uh, put my graduation on hold uh, and let me just spend every day with you. And my mother said, you're about to graduate from a great school you're about to get a great job in New York doing as an analyst doing M&A and the last thing I want you to do is to stop your life and so that actually for my mother was very untraditional because usually the parents are like yeah stop your life come back here right now and my mom was untraditional in that aspect where she said the best thing you can do for me is to carry on with your life and not let me stop your life so it's painful but I went back to school I graduated and then she passed away and then I moved to New York so you know there's this whole thing of filial piety and it does create a lot of pressure on the child. Your life does kind of revolve almost at your parents' beck and call, which is not easy. I was lucky in that my mom forced me to go in my life, but with Cherie, you know, that was 10 months of her life of being a good daughter in the traditional Chinese way and stopping her life until her mom passed away. All right, guys, what are the three takeaways from episode two of Bling Empire? Number one, money does not equal manners. Just because you're rich does not mean you're well brought up. How can you be well brought up? Well, actually, it really is just mostly the responsibility of the mother. Did your mom teach you good manners? Did your mom bring you up well? 
Takeaway two, Chinese culture is about a community, not about you as a self. Therefore, there's a shit ton of sacrificing your own needs, your own desires, how you want to live your life for how your parents want you to live your life, how everybody else wants things to balance. Takeaway three, Chinese food is mega nutritious. Go Google that pork knuckle in vinegar and ginger recipe and give it a try. Would you dare eat what was on Shuri's stovetop? I know I would, it's my favorite dish. All right, guys, don't forget to like, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and stay tuned for episode three. See ya! Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. I'll be posting a new video each week who have tips and tricks that I think will help all of us lead a better life.